Okay, I'm back. Um, the place conclusion, I think, is really important and interesting. Generically, it's an early play, and it kind of sets the sets the stage for other plays, other comedies, very specifically to um, to keep us on our edge, right? Um, that the dissatisfaction that we feel it's it's palpable right that we really cannot be pleased with the conclusion it's cute it's funny it's you know my gosh thank god the upheaval in nature has been settled or whatever but we it's we feel i mean and, and i hate to be vulgar about it but um we also feel that well, I hate to be vulgar about it, and this is what I wanted to say. I got distracted because all these university emails are popping up at me. Um, we feel almost sick to the stomach thinking about what kind of hideous tricks um, Oberon has pulled, right, to get this world to comedic order. Um, is that the expense we are willing to pay becomes a question that the audience has to deal with and especially given the kind of meta theatrical um pushings that conclude the play we really uh i think are uncomfortable with with the possibility of it all being done for our sake. And none of this is made easier by Park, who shows up, right, at the end, to say, sorry, not sorry. Um, oh, we did this for your sake. If you didn't care for it, at least forgive us, darlings, right? I mean, he's got this audacity to show up with a broom, sweeping up this the muck and the dirt that's left behind and that we can sense can even smell right it's like an upset stomach that is gurgling inside of us um that puck does nothing to settle um so so as many of you have pondered and asked is this a comedy and i would argue that Shakespeare seems to be saying, well, you want a comedy, you want the world to be peaceful and have a restored sense of order. Um, yeah, it's a comedy. And that's what we have to deal with, the, the, the compromised state of um, plot, right? That, that this is, this is what um the status quo entails if comedy means um marriage and babies a heteronormative futurity if you will where um the present finds itself inserted into uh, a temporal moment that is other to it um if that is what we think of as progress um then a lot of things must remain unsettled some things will be shattered in this in this configuration of futurity so generically the comedy of this period does not require anything other than marriage the avoidance of death marriage and the premise of progeny which of course is why marriage happens at the end of the play um if you think about what oberon has his fairies do trippingly right like they're supposed to trip around the rooms and say stuff like um oh well let these babies that are born of these you know uh copulatory situations let these babies not have even hair lips let them be without disability, let them be without problems that compromise patriarchy. I had mentioned um, in class, so I won't do it elaborately um, out here, how 
um, fairies were considered responsible for um, the deformities of a fetus or a baby, right? And um, Oberon here is very careful to say, well, we are we're making sure the babies that are born of these weird relationships are not going to have hair lips even, right? They're going to be without any um, sign of a flaw. But of course, we can't be satisfied because the massive flaws exist in Helena uh, being married to a guy who's still kind of under toxic influence. Um, but while she may have wanted this, she is, to our understanding, uh, hooking up, marrying a man who, because he promised to violate her virginity and therefore take away whatever power she might have had within a patriarchal structure, he is a He's a compromised patriarch himself, right? So this marriage is almost like a punishment for both. Um, that's happening. Um, Hermia has that nightmare, right? Um, after she refuses to sleep with um, Lysander before they're married, Hermia has a, uh, a nightmare. She wakes up to Lysander being a totally different guy, being interested in a to totally different woman um, and she's married now to a man whose flippancy um, and flip floppiness is in our memory right and it can't be unremembered um, and of course Titania who has hooked up with Bottom right is now back with Oberon, who is now in possession and control of the Indian boy, and hasn't yet, as the play ends, informed Titania of her dalliance. Right? One only wonders when that will happen, who will share that with her, because of course, in this vision, in this fairy world, now Puck also has more power than Titania does, and that he too knows my mistress is in love with the monster, right? She, she's hooked up with Bottom. Um, so it's a world in which patriarchy has been restored, reproductive futurity is kind of ensured, um, but it's a world that leaves us almost bitter, and that I would argue is Shakespeare's point about comedy. You want it to be harmonious and uh, orderly. You will have to bite your tongue and take it as I offer it. It will be compromised, it will need a lot of cleaning up, and we won't see it cleaned up. We will just have somebody kind of shady somebody right i mean there's hardly any character more sketchy than puck to show up to apologize and to show up to clean up so i think that's part of the limboid space within which all of shakespeare's comedies function so keep that in mind as we read twelfth night next right um the price of comedy is fairly steep and certainly the audience's discomfort is part of the price that we pay right um, so that's that's my little thing on patriarchy we have just about five minutes so I'm going to talk very quickly about um, monstrosity as the play concludes and things come back to order um, we might remember with horror the violations of um, characters, bodies, and beings, uh, but I will say what is really becoming 
in this character uh, in this play what is um what is provocative and i will say even hopefully provocative is the tiny moments um of transgression and temporal disruption that cannot again be forgotten or undone right so bottom being adopted and embraced by titania and the fairy world is is that big moment it's not a big moment but it's a push moment where the cross species the um human fairy intimacy but more importantly the human fairy pleasure unit comes to be formed right and we see how those that are at the bottom of the barrel the those that are marginalized those that are being stamped on by the patriarchal order uh, or an ordering machine have ways in which to uh, ways in which to write back the subaltern does write back a la Gayatri Spivak right so um, for those of you that are not familiar with that Gayatri Spivak reference um, take critical theory English 483 and you will be empowered um, theoretically to understand how uh, these moments of pleasure these moments in which the subaltern or the marginalized subject um, writes back or responds in a way that is powerful are moments that we must not only note but record right and um, make transparent through our own articulation and re-articulation of those possibilities so that that is part of what Gayatri Spivak a post-colonialist feminist critic talks about um, and I'm applying some of her methods in thinking about um, how the subaltern bodies, how the marginalized bodies in A Midsummer Night's Dream find ways in which to write back, to resist the dominant institutional structures that are operating within the play, be they those of marriage, be they those of patriarchy, be they those of monarchy or autocracy. Um, they do get to be played around with in ways that cannot be forgotten and the pleasure of that playfulness cannot be forgotten more importantly right so keeping that in mind let us look at uh, 13 minutes so let's look at when um titania and bottom have their initial encounter right um so titania wakes up and she goes what angel wakes me from my flowery bed because bottom has been singing right to say pretend that he's not afraid of being alone in the desert uh, in the desert i'm saying in the forest when his friends have apparently run away um so titania says and this is act three scene one um i pray thee gentle mortal sing again my ear is much enamoured of thy note, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on my first view to say, to swear, I love thee. I mean, it's oh, so adorable. The musicality of that, those set, that set of lines is just, just beautiful, right? The alliterations, the sound that uh, her desire and her craving produces it's just um it's tremendous right I, I i absolutely love this speech um but then when bottom says oh god how weird you are you know i don't understand why you think i'm this hot stuff um she goes thou art as wise as thou art beautiful right and i'm sure this is like the audience watching this for the first time would have been just laughing up a storm as do we right the modern audience does that too i'll continue talking about this as we fade out of this lecture and go into the next lecture patience please i am coming right back with more lectures for you thank you <laughs>